Oh gosh, Mercedes, you shouldn't. A present for me? Oh, thank you so much. It must be jewellery or something in this really extravagant black box. What could it possibly be? Oh, it's a small black cube with a red light on it. With no monetary value for resale. Hmm. Thanks, car. What Mercedes is actually giving to owners of 2002 onwards cars is a Mercedes Mi adapter which allows you to connect your smartphone to the car to monitor certain functions and be more interactive with the vehicle. Let's have a look what it can do. Getting the Mi adapter added to your car involves going to the Mercedes dealership and a certain amount of this. And when it comes out of the workshop, the adapter will be fitted in the OBD port and you could have used your coffee drinking time to have downloaded the app, the Mercedes Mi adapter app. What it does, it connects with the car's computer and having synced the car with it so it knows this is my car here, it tells you various things that so a lot of it is duplicated from the car's own dashboard but it just puts it in one place so it's easy to find and if you're not in the car, you can find it as well. For example, I know the car has been parked seven minutes, eight minutes now. I've got 22 litres of diesel in the car. I've got a range of 162 miles. It tells me my current mileage of 79,500 miles and my local Mercedes-Benz dealer, and I've got 8,821 miles to my next service. And the current battery voltage is 14.2 volts. You might not think this is terribly useful to know, but perhaps if you're on holiday and you want to keep an eye on your car in the car park at the airport, perhaps you might, I don't know. Or if you're sitting indoors wondering if you're going to need petrol to get to work tomorrow, if you've got a long trip planned, you can just quickly tap on the phone and see if you've got enough fuel to make it to wherever you're going the next day. If you rotate the phone from portrait to landscape, you get a second menu come up, which tells you how long you've been driving for, how far you've driven, your average MP, MPG or speed, uh, the time and date for a third time, this is also in the nav screen and your dashboard, your position on a map, and your heading on a compass, which is, again, duplicating various things. It means you can have other things on the main screen and the dashboard and other things on there, and you can have that information available if you, if you want it. It's just quite a nice thing to have, really. What's more useful, I've found, is the sub-menu, um, which does some things which are, again, duplicated by the systems. Find my parking space tells you where the car is parked. Apple will do a similar thing with the iPhone. Uh, refueling statistics, if you're of a mind to get into your, delve deep into your fueling. A lot of these little functions sort of come down to business use in a way really. Uh, refueling statistics and my trips are really handy if you fill out expenses forms. Refueling statistics will tell you the time, date, um, the mileage of the car and how many litres you put in and approximately where you were when you did it as well um, because it's tied into the sat nav. Um, so if you're filling out expenses forms you can see exactly how much fuel you put in. If you go by mileage rather than fuel receipts um, you can see that exactly where you were and where you drove. For example, I know that I drove five miles and three miles and one mile and eight miles uh, on the 11th, but going back a few other weeks, uh, I did 24 miles, stopped for a break, and then did 160. Um, when I'm filling out my expenses forms by mile, this is really, really handy. Now, there's one really fantastic feature on this, this app which I would love to, to work, and this is the main reason I actually got the thing installed. The sat-nav in this car, okay, it's a very accurate system, but the input is shockingly bad. Um, and you can input your destinations from other sources. You can go from uh, Safari, and you can go from Google Maps and from Apple Maps, and then you can export to here to send to the car. Unfortunately, this generation of W204 doesn't support that. I need the next generation of radio for that to work. Well, that was a huge crushing disappointment when I found that wouldn't work. It doesn't seem to say how fast you've been. So that's one thing if you're worried about too much spying on your information, it doesn't appear to recall um, how quickly you were going at any given time, although you could perhaps work out from the two points you've been to and from how quickly you were going between two set points. You can book a service with it. There are a lot of little functions in here. If I'm honest, it's a bit of a gimmick, but it's a fun gimmick and it's, it's sort of useful. When putting my expenses together saves an awful lot of time rather than going through a Google Maps and a calendar to work out where I've been and how far I've driven a month later. Um, and as it's free, there's really no reason not to do it, especially if you've got the car booked in for a service anytime soon. Um, and yeah, it just tells you everything about the car. For example, this car's now done 79,503 miles. 
which is a good time to segue into my first three months and seven and a half thousand miles in a W204 because when I bought this car it was more or less bang on 72,000 miles so I've now done seven and a half thousand miles in three months and what's there to say about this car well basically this is the perfect car um, it overall is averaging about 47 mpg on short journeys it averages about 33 34 because there's more stop starts and a lot of traffic works and road works and stop signs around at the moment well beyond adding some winter tires and putting in diesel there's only two things that are really flagged up on this car in terms of maintenance in the last seven and a half thousand miles yesterday it started flagging that the coolant was low uh, looking in the container there it doesn't actually look very low maybe it must be like a fraction of a millimeter down so i'll top that up and one of the headlight bulbs blew so i went to go and change that that's no biggie you might think except this is very strange i've never seen a broken headlamp unit before and i've no idea how it could have become broken because there's no physical damage to the rest of the car um, but it looks like a fault line you can see it now with the um, headlight on couldn't see it before the light turned off when i inspected the thing because you know it's black and dark down there and why would you even think a headlight unit is going to be broken but the rac warranty doesn't cover it as the main part and it's been three months and a couple of days since i bought the car so the dealer who sold it don't want to know so I'm guessing I'm going to be spending two or three hundred pounds on eBay for a second hand one of these units from a breaker's yard and fitting that at some point in the near future. Won't that be fun? So a mystery broken headlight and slightly low coolant aside this car has basically been faultless for nearly 10,000 miles which is you know, to be expected of a modern car but you know, it is pushing 10 years old now it doesn't really look it but it's 2010 car and it's 2019 in a month so it's no spring chicken but yeah basically to, to drive it's very very nice comfort wise it's very very nice economy is pretty good acceleration and performance pretty good um, yeah there's really nothing to vault it I, mean, I was on a job recently and a guy there was a professional breakdown driver and he glanced at this thing and said oh I'll pretty much never go out to those which is a nice little sort of thumbs up seal of approval and looks nice on the drive it's nice to be in really there are only two things that I don't like about this car and they are quite big bugbears really first of all and I think I mentioned it when I first got the car the foot operated parking brake is a pain in the bum it is a real real nuisance uh, and it's not all that good even when you push it very hard to the point that at one point when I was pushing it so hard to make the car stop on hills I actually started making the driver's seat creak um, after that I just started parking it in first and reverse for a bit and the seat seems to have calmed down again um, I think because the previous owner had not been using it a great deal the park brake was not very efficient so I was having to push it very very hard indeed uh, but you know hill starts are a real faff with a release the thing down there malarkey and then uh, you know foot off the clutch into neutral um, park brake blah 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 that's just aggro and I don't like it don't like it at all Ugh. and the other thing is the radio the infotainment system it's just a fraction too old to have a lot of the really cool stuff that you really can't expect today uh, things like DAB would be a luxury but it would be nice if it did have it um, you can't plug your phone into it and play music off there's no aux input on it at all it's got a six disc a six I can't say that a six disc CD changer there appears to be a Barry Manilow uh, disc that someone has left in the car that was a, an unexpected bonus if you happen to like Barry Manilow I guess I can get some Copacabana on um, yeah and if I want to update the, the maps the latest version that's gonna be a horrific amount of money anyway, here's a demonstration I'm on a hill at a stoplight into neutral foot on the brake oh god the car rolls back a tiny bit and now I can I can sit here but when I want to go I've pushed the foot pedal down and it'll hold the car for a second or so and I can pull the release handle and off we pop uh, driving the Alpha the other day it was a real breath of fresh air to actually use a proper handbrake and the replacement for this sadly is one of those stupid electronic things on the 205 uh, shape C-Class so it's vaguely easier but it's still not an improvement 
bring back proper handbrakes. In fact, my next video might be things I really hate in new cars. I, well, if I've got time for everything I hate in new cars, I'll slim it down to maybe two or three and just go on and on and on about them. But yeah, back to the Mercedes. Um, yeah, it, it's brilliant. If you are looking for a used car under £10,000, which has got a decent badge on the front, drives well, is economical, got a huge boot, is comfortable, is safe, this is your car. It really is good. To move on to the next generation of car would basically double your budget, and I'm not sure it's worth it for the advantages. Here we go. It's not a quick getaway and then you nearly stall because you're not on the accelerator properly. Oh, damn it. I wish I hadn't caught that on camera. That was the worst one I've ever done because I was trying to talk about how to do it. Well, that was my very, very brief update on the W204 C250D AMG Sportline. It's a great car. I love it. It's a really, really good car. I'm very happy with it indeed. Thanks for asking. Thanks for watching. Thanks for hitting like, which I'm sure you're going to. Please pop over to Furious Driving and uh, hit up Amazon or eBay and uh, a little slice of that. Um, a few pennies comes back if you buy anything at all and it helps pay for the channel. And um, next time you see this car will either be if it snows at the weekend, then I get to go and test those winter tyres, or if I find some money and buy a headlight and then I'll show you how to change a headlight on one of these. And I'll tell you the way to change a headlight on one of these. You ring up Trevor and you say, Trevor mate, I need to change a headlight and then drop it off there drive home in his terrible Vectra and come back with a wad of money a little bit later on because frankly that would be no fun at all. Bye. If anyone would like a copy of Barry Manilow, Ultimate Manilow, then uh, message me and I will post it to you and it'll be my first freebie giveaway on the channel.